Great, so I'll be talking today about the history of crypto art, but uh, before I get in, just a, a quick background about me. So as mentioned, uh, I was one of the co-founders of the Stanford Blockchain Club. Um, back then it was like probably only a dozen of us and it's like pretty crazy to see how the club has grown significantly since now there's a class, so it's really good to be back. Um, I got into crypto, I, I guess my freshman year, I wrote my freshman power paper. If you're an undergrad, you know what power is. So I wrote my freshman power paper on Ethereum. Uh, this is like right when Ethereum launched. Um, and since then, um, since college, uh, I had one confirmation, which is a $130 million seed fund. Um, we've made a lot of big NFT investments, such as leading the seed round of OpenSea in 2018. Um, we also have a NFT fund now, so not only do we invest in early stage projects in the crypto space, we also like buy JPEGs and artworks directly. And lastly, I just want to mention that uh, I built a personal website called CryptoArt.io, which it basically aggregates all the NFT art sales across different marketplaces. So it's really cool when artists can see all of their sales in one place. So without further ado, um, I guess before we get into NFTs, I guess kind of want to talk about how digital, digital artists make money. So, you know, you can be an artist that um, you, you, you don't um, create drawings or paintings, but like you just have a large uh, Instagram portfolio and you have like hundreds of thousands of followers. And like, how do you make a living as a digital artist? Um, and before NFTs, there were a couple ways to do so. Um, the first one, obviously, is to sell prints. Um, so this is an artist named Etienne Krauss. Um, and selling prints is like kind of like selling posters. Like you might sell them for like a couple hundred dollars each. Um, but these prints, uh, they never garnered a lot of money because um, they're like you're selling posters. So you're only selling copies of the artworks rather than the original authentic one, which is what the collector wants. So it's like selling a poster of the Mona Lisa versus like the actual Mona Lisa itself. Like one is worth much more than the other. Um, and the other way, that artists make money is through commissions. And this can range from things like uh, creating album art for uh, musicians. So like there are a lot of musicians that create a new album. Uh, they need an artist to design the, uh, the album art uh, and they'll earn like probably like $500 to a couple thousand for designing the album art. Um, and if you're a really well-established artist or design studio, then you can get like bigger clients like Fortune 500 companies. So uh, this is one of my favorite uh, interior design studios called Six and Five. And they just, in 2019, they had a really good, big um, collaboration with Microsoft to design all the wallpaper art for the Microsoft, Surf Microsoft Surface. Um, and you know, these uh, big design gigs can range from like a couple of thousand dollars to tens of thousands dollars of dollars. Um, so like all in all, like artists are usually making money from selling prints or doing commissions. Um, but what, what I really want to get into is that uh, NFTs are a new a business model for digital artists. So not only do they make money from selling prints and doing commissions, they can also sell individual artworks like how you would sell paintings. Uh, so it kind of revolutionizes the whole uh, way like creators make money in, dig in this digital world is uh, before we were kind of in this patronage business model where you make money from having a patron like Microsoft and then now you can be an independent creator where you sell an Instagram photo as an NFT and that can be worth like a lot, like thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. Um, and NFT solves like the right click save as problem that people talk about for JPEGs because collectors know this is the original version that was minted from the artist uh, and that's the one that's worth a lot of money. So um, I want to talk a bit about the early NFT history before crypto art. So um, this is like kind of not really talked about much, but um, you know, CryptoPunks wasn't the very first NFT. Uh, there were a lot of attempts at NFTs before that, you know, starting back with Bitcoin. So, you know, colored coins was a thing uh, in Bitcoin in the early days. Um, basically, uh, you would trace a Bitcoin from like when it was minted, um, like kind of in the Genesis block and uh, make these Bitcoin like non-fungible, where like certain Bitcoin are worth more than others because they came from, they were minted in certain ways, came from certain addresses. And like that was kind of the first attempt at making, you know, Bitcoin non-fungible and applying that concept to NFTs. 
Uh, and then we have a slew of other projects, um, no, no, starting with Counterparty, which is a you know, Bitcoin sidechain that uh, enabled like, NFT functionalities. And you had early projects built on Counterparty, like you know, Spells of Genesis, more trading cards, Rare Pepe's. Um, and Rare Pepe's uh, eventually migrated from Bitcoin to Ethereum. So Rare Pepe's was really one of the first NFT projects that uh, preceded CryptoPunks. Um, and then the whole space really started, um, well, it really like kind of people think of CryptoPunks as like the first um, brand name NFT project. And that started back in June 2017. Um, and this was at the time when you know, the ERC-721 standard wasn't invented. It was still ERC-20. So uh, it was kind of this hacky way of having NFTs in a fungible, using like the fungible token standard. Um, and basically, if you aren't familiar with CryptoPunks, it's basically a collection of 10,000 uh, profile pictures, each with you know, different unique character traits in their avatars. You know, some traits are more rare than others, like alien punks, uh, zombie punks, um, ape punks are worth like, much more than others because there's only a, a very few number of those. Um, and then we get to um, January 2018, and this is when the ERC-721 standard was finally invented. And this is uh, kind of the first big NFT standard. And it was invented by Dapper Labs, which is the company behind CryptoKitties. So like I said before, before um, 721, like all these NFT projects were trying to use uh, hacky ways of creating um, fungible tokens like um, Ethereum ICO tokens and using those for NFTs. But now there's finally a standard uh, for NFTs and that's really kicked off a lot of new projects uh, building on the standard. So now we got, went through the early NFT history, let's talk a bit about crypto art. So crypto art is like really a subsector of NFTs and you know, a lot of people kind of lump everything that's NFT that has to do with art, but there's a lot more to NFTs that's just art. There's you know, music, there's gaming, there's like IP rights. Um, and crypto art was like really one of the first um, verticals within NFTs, one of the first niches that really kind of got a, got a big community early on. Um, so the artist, uh, the, sorry, the collector, Jason Bailey, who goes by Art Gnome, he was really the first person to uh, talk about crypto art and even coined the term. And you know, on the screen here, this is the formal definition of crypto art. Um, but Jason Bailey is a guy who's, uh, he's been collecting super early. Uh, he's, he's, he was also into uh, like kind of traditional art before he got into crypto and was writing a lot about the potential of you know, blockchain tech and how that can be used uh, in the art world. Um, so he coined the term crypto art um, and shortly thereafter, um, the first crypto art platform emerged, uh, which was super rare. Um, so around April, uh, that's when the first a uh, piece of crypto art um, got minted, and it's called AI Generated New Portrait. Uh, the artist uh, is an artist named Robbie Barat, uh, who goes by Videodrome. Uh, Robbie Barat actually used to live uh, right next to Stanford. I think he was uh, like somewhere in Palo Alto, Menlo Park. He now uh, moved to Amsterdam, but he was like kind of this uh, early AI artist who was experimenting with a lot of different things. Uh, came across Super Rare, decided to uh, mint one of his GAN art pieces. And you know, GAN stands for Gener Generative Adversarial Networks. So it's, uh, it, it's really popular now with stable diffusion. But basically, uh, you, take, uh, you take an image that's a seed, you feed it through the AI algorithm, and you see like, what are the intermediate steps. And then you take that and then use that as your artwork. Uh, so he was like four or five years uh, to this trend before kind of stable diffusion and like the current uh, open AI hype like made it really cool. Um, so uh, th back in April 2018, uh, he sold this piece for uh, 0.46 ETH, which at the time was $177. Um, so you know, that was a big deal at the time because it showed that people were willing to pay at least something for NFTs. Um, but fast forward a few years later, and then we, one confirmation, we actually bought this artwork um, we bought it for 100 ETH, which is 112K at the time. So that's a 217X increase from the initial sale price. So uh, Videodrome, uh, Robbie Brock, sorry, Art Gnome got a pretty 
big windfall from that, uh, not only from that sale, but also the, all the intermediary collectors that the, uh, the piece changed hands through. Um, and I, I think this will be uh, kind of one of the pioneering pieces in like art history textbooks, just for the fact that it was the first piece of crypto art uh, minted on chain. Um, and there's actually another uh, fun story in the early crypto art history. Um, so there's a story of the Lost Robbies. Uh, so this was around, uh, you know, I think June, July, yeah, July 2018. Uh, so this was at a conference in London where, you know, Super Rare was talking about, uh, they were like kind of pitching Christie's and like all these boomer traditional art collectors about the promise of NFTs and crypto art. And like, obviously, like kind of the 300 attendees that attended, most of them didn't really get it. Um, and as part of their presentation, and they had these gift bags where there was a QR code and you could scan it uh, to claim uh, a piece of Robbie Barak crypto art. And obviously, you know, most people, when you pick up these QR codes and gift bags from conferences, you just throw them away immediately. But the lucky 12 people who actually did claim their Robbie Barats, um, those pieces sell for six figures today. Um, and since all the others haven't been claimed, it's highly likely that the remaining 288 are lost forever. So in crypto art lore, uh, those are called the lost Robbies. And you, know, you can see here in this, uh, in this tweet, um, a lot of these different uh, pieces, those are different variations of the lost Robbies that are lost forever. So that's just like a kind of fun anecdote from the early history. Um, and Another piece of early crypto art history is this artist named X Copy. So, um, so the fifth to 16th artworks uh, minted on Super Rare were all by X Copy. Um, and all 12 of these pieces, um, they're worth a lot today because uh, one of the features of the blockchain is it timestamps uh, when NFTs or like when any transaction happens. Uh, and that's another beauty of the blockchain is that it's an immutable ledger, so you can't go back in history and like change those timestamps. And like that's kind of the advantage that Super Rare and these early artists have is they have the advantage of being first. Uh, so they always have this good narrative that we're first to this industry. Um, here's the proof on the on the blockchain that we minted these artworks early, and like no other no other new artists can replicate this because uh, we came here first. So like each of these pieces. Uh, will sell for about six to seven figures. Um, and you know, these are 12 like the most valuable pieces of crypto art just because uh, they were some of the very first uh, pieces minted on chain. Um, and that also like ties to this point, um, which is the second value prop of, of like why crypto art matters, why having a blockchain is powerful, is the blockchain provides uh, provenance. And you know, I, I talked a bit about the timestamping. The other thing is uh, just being able to trace ownership from the artist, like through all of the series of collectors, as they keep uh, reselling the, as they keep reselling the pieces to like who the current owner is. And you'd be surprised how like art fraud is actually a really big problem in the traditional art world, um, especially when you have like artworks that are kind of hidden in this like Swiss warehouse that are used for like money laundering for tax evasion. And it's just changing hands constantly through a series of paperwork. But no one can really tell um, exactly which hands this artwork changed through. And there isn't really um, a ledger that traces the history uh, versus having a blockchain. It's all transparent. You can see uh, who exactly the artist did a primary sale, how much all the uh, subsequent secondary sales are, and who the current collector is. Um, and the other part that, what that I talk, uh, talked about a bit is um, because of these immutable timestamps that the blockchain provides, um, it creates something known as the Lindy effect, um, which is basically the notion that the longer something's been around, uh, the more valuable it is uh, and like, the more secure it is. And this is why the early artists' uh, pieces are valuable, because they were first to the category and they've been around for a long time. And this is also why uh, you know, people talk about NFTs minted on other blockchains like Solana or Tezos. And like, this is why uh, Ethereum NFTs command a premium to Solana and Tezos NFTs, is because Ethereum was first uh, and there's a stronger security guarantee. And that's why they're more valuable. And you can also say the same thing with other marketplaces. Like 
and artists will mint um, NFTs across lo lots of different marketplaces, not just Super Rare, but there's also you know, Foundation, Nifty Gateway, uh, known origin makers place like the list goes on. But the reason why the super rare NFTs will sell for more compared to all the other marketplaces is because super rare was first as kind of this premium brand and artists want to get curated, want to get listed on super rare and collectors will pay a premium for a super rare NFT. And this all ties to the Lindy effect. Um, and the last thing I'll say about like why the blockchain matters for art uh, is like programmatic royalties. Um, so earlier, um, you know, when I talked about this Robbie Barat piece uh, that sold for $177 and in the primary sale, uh, because of the Super Rare's artist royalty system, Robbie Barat actually earned uh, $10,000, roughly $10,000 from the most recent sale in just in artist royalties. Um, and that's really powerful for artists uh, because you can have an artist that becomes super big and their collectors will be able to flip or like resell something for much more like down the road. But the artist capture, in, in the traditional art world, the artist captures none of that value. Uh, but now with art, artist royalties, the artist uh, gets to capture the value of their artists, uh, artworks appreciating, not just the collector. Um, and this is really, really beneficial for early super rare artists. Uh, you know, I talk about Robbie Barat, um, you know, X Copy, one of the other the other su early super rare artists, um, he's earning a lot more from from royalties because you know back in the early days these pieces were only selling for a couple hundred dollars, and you know now from or artist royalties um, they're making ten to hundred times more than that just from the royalties alone. Uh, so we talked a bit about uh, fine art, uh, which fine art was really the first. Uh, subgenre of crypto art that really emerged. Uh, but kind of in parallel, uh, there was another genre of crypto art called generative art. Uh, so first, uh, what exactly is generative art? So um, it's a class of digital art where artists use a computer to introduce randomness as a part, por, uh, part of the creation process. Um, and you know, here's a quote from Snowfro, Snowfro who's the founder of Artblocks, um, who talks about uh, generative art, how this is revolutionary because it enables a new art form that like wasn't possible before. Uh, so the first uh, piece of generative art uh, was, or the first generative art collection was in, created in April 2019 called Aut Autoglyphs. Uh, and this was created by the same team that created CryptoPunks. Um, it's, it's basically, uh, it's an addition of 512 pieces uh, created by smart contract code. And uh, I'll get into the code um, in, a, uh, in a bit, but basically you seed it with a random number generator, and then you hash it uh, to create some random value. And then based on the value, uh, you give it instructions, like kind of a bunch of if statements uh, as you loop through, uh, the, hash, through the hash uh, values. Uh, and that will tell the, um, that will tell the, the code to print out certain ASCII uh, characters, and then when you piece that together, you create this um, entire artwork, which is called an autoglyph. Um, you know, and this is this is uh, kind of the code that I was talking about earlier. So, um, you know, you pass in the function, you pass in the seed, uh, you pass an ID, which converts to the seed, and that seed is created through entropy from the blockchain. So that can be things like, you know, block number, uh, timestamp. Um, and that entropy is used to create a random hash value. Um, and then from the hash value, uh, you can see in like kind of the bottom half of the code, you see a bunch of if statements. And through each if statement, uh, it tells, um, it, like, conc it concatenates a, a piece of ASCII um, based on like what the hex value is. And then once you iterate through all of these uh, characters, and that's how you create the entire autoglyph. Um, so Autoglyphs was the first uh, generative art project, uh, but generative art didn't really take off until a project uh, called Artblocks uh, came along. And this was you know, late 2020. Um, so Artblocks was uh, founded by uh, Eric Calderon, who's also known as Snowfro. So Eric was actually um, a pro prolific artist uh, before he got into crypto and blockchains and generative art. Um, and he's been doing this you know, off-chain 
um, using other techniques. And he decided, like, why don't I bring this technique on chain and create this art platform called art, called art Blocks. And he minted the, since he's an artist himself, he minted the very first Art Blocks uh, collection called uh, Chromey Squiggles. So, you know, as you can see here, um, there's a lot of different uh, variations of squiggles, uh, each with different uh, rarity characteristics. And you know, as these are minted, it's using the entropy of the blockchain to decide, OK, token number one is going to be this, say, a standard uh, squiggle. Token number two is going to be a fuzzy squiggle, and so on and so forth, until you reach, uh, say, 10,000 squiggles. Um, and this is all randomly generated by, by the blockchain. And it's, it's a unique art form enabled uh, by the blockchain because um, of the entropy associated. Um, so Chromey Squiggles was like the first um, art blocks project. And uh, since then, there's been a couple hundred art blocks projects. And two of the most uh, notable ones are uh, Ringers and Fidenza. So Ringers is created, was created by Dmitry Cherniak, who is also another prolific generative, generative artist before NFTs and crypto came along. Um, and as you can see here, it's basically a bunch of uh, pegs and lines and colors, and kind of the orientation of these pegs and lines and colors is like created by uh, entropy, which certain uh, Ringers are worth more than others because they're more rare. Uh, and Fidenza is similarly another uh, project by Tyler Hobbs, who's um, a, a big prolific generative artist. And it's a series of tiles uh, created uh, through entropy. And you know, I, I think the floor price now for Ringers is around uh, 40 ETH-ish. And then for Fidenza, it's like around 70 ETH. Uh, so like, you know, these were you know, only uh, I think they were like sub sub one ETH at the time they were minted, and since then uh, collectors see generative art as a, a valuable st uh, store of value, and that's why the floor price has increased by so much. Um, and so you know we had these uh, early art projects um, like you know with super rare uh, art blocks, autoglyphs, CryptoPunks. Uh, but art was still like pretty, crypto art was still pretty confined to crypto natives. Like, you know, only, only people who really uh, understood um, the value of crypto, uh, really understood it, uh, believed in the potential of crypto art. And like, crypto art didn't really go mainstream until uh, this guy came along. Um, and this guy's name is Beeple. Uh, who's, well, Beeple is his uh, kind of alias name, but uh, his real name is Mike Winkleman. And, uh, he was actually, he's actually the first like very well known artist outside of crypto uh, to finally learn what NFTs are and decide to mint something um, in crypto. So even before he got into NFTs, he already had over a million Instagram followers. Uh, and his kind of claim to fame is uh, he minted. Uh, he's one of the most prolific uh, VFX artists. Uh, so what that is is basically it stands for visual effects. Uh, use a piece of software called Cinema 4D, and that's uh, it's kind of like Photoshop-ish, but you create all these uh, 3D graphics with uh, different uh, models, like you know figurines, heads. You can see in like a screenshot in the bottom right corner uh, of the photo um, of like him in the process of creating a piece of artwork. Um, and he started these every days uh, back in 2007, where he create a new piece of artwork every day since 2007, and he hasn't missed a single day. Uh, and it's actually uh, pretty crazy how he's kept this up. And you can see like um, artworks that he's created during certain anniversaries, like uh, when his daughter was born, uh, when he was sick. Uh, but even throughout all these different milestones in his life, uh, he still never missed a day of creating artwork. Um, so that's kind of his claim to fame. Uh, so he was really famous for creating his everyday series. but. Uh, he was never really able to monetize that. It was like he would create a piece of artwork, post it on Instagram, uh, and like he would get a big Instagram following, but um, no one was really paying for it. Uh, so instead, uh, he had to kind of make a living through doing other jobs, like um, creating graphics for concert visuals. So like when a big uh, DJ or EDM artist uh, tours, uh, they need uh, big concert visuals behind them, and he would create those visuals. Or uh, he would also do other um, commission artworks for clients, 
uh, that was also another way that artists uh, during the digital artists during the time made a living. Um, and that all changed when he decided to uh, mint NFTs. So, you know, it was back in October 2020 where you know people learned about NFTs and minted his very first piece, uh, which is a, a piece called "Politics Is Bullshit." Um, and you know, this is a piece uh, minted on Nifty Gateway. It was only an edition of 100, and uh, as kind of a joke, uh, he set the mint price to a dollar. So obviously, they got sold out in less than a second. Um, and if you're one of the lucky 100 people that was able to snag uh, this piece, uh, today it would be worth, um, the floor price right now is 85 ETH, which is about 130,000. Um, so that's a pretty good return for being like super fast at clicking the buy button. Um, and uh, I guess I also want to talk about Nifty Gateway, where um, you know, today I've talked about you know, one of one art, art, like on Super Rare, where it's only artists selling one piece, or like a collection of like say 10,000 like generative pieces. But Nifty Gateway uh, popularized a new way of artists uh, selling works, uh, which are called editions and open editions. So edition can be um, say edition of uh, five or edition of 100, and it's like the same uh, JPEG. Uh, but that way you have like five different collectors or a hundred different collectors who can collect your piece and like that helps an artist get more buy-in and like a bigger community of collectors. And there's also something called open editions which is um, kind of unlimited mints. So uh, uh, an artist will say, okay, for the next uh, 10 minutes uh, anyone can mint my piece and after that it's like uh, done forever. Um, and that was a really popular way for uh, a bunch of like thousands of collectors to get a really cheap piece from their favorite artist without having to pay a lot to buy a one of one. Um, so after that October sale, uh, people did a couple more drops, uh, you know, mix of editions, one of ones, open editions. Uh, but things didn't really get super crazy until uh, March 2021. Um, and this is when people did the auction at Christie's um, through uh, our platform called A Maker's Place. And you know, this is a collage of uh, the first 5,000 everyday's pieces. So like I said earlier, uh, Beeples had created a new piece of art from 2007 all the way to 2021 uh, without missing a single day. And this is a collage of every single one of those artworks. Um, and he decided to auction this off at Christie's. And uh, there was a lot of press coverage at the time because uh, there was already a bidding war going on, and uh, and I, I was watching this live, and it was crazy. As the auction was closing, um, the kind of the bids uh, jumped from like a couple million, and then it went to like 20 million, and then it went to 50 million, and then finally um, a collector uh, paid 69 million for this piece of artwork, and immediately uh, that kind of blew up the entire art world. Um, it got on like the front page of like every single newspaper. Um, and this is also the sixth highest artwork sale of all time by a living artist. Um, and you know, people's in the kind of the same names as these legends like you know, Jasper Johns, Damien Hurst, um, you can see Jeff Koons, um, these like very, very big name artists in the traditional art world, and like he's up there with all of them. And Last thing I'll say is the collector, his name is uh, Meta Kovan. Uh, he's an Indian billionaire, uh, crypto billionaire, and he's been collecting art for a very long time. He doesn't not only owns this one piece, but he also owns all of uh, people's one of ones. So he's the largest people collector, also has an NFT fund, um, and uh, he's, he's not looking to sell this. So he's just kind of patiently waiting and thinks that this is um, a historical piece of art. Do you raise your hand? Yeah, uh, I have, I'm just curious. I have a question. Uh, what would be the motivation for someone to buy this? Like, um, you know, maybe. maybe the question, so. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is like, what's the motivation for someone to buy this? Well, if you think it's like a piece of like art history, like significance, uh, then uh, you would pay like a, a stupidly high price because you would think that in like 50 years from now it will be worth even more. Um, and that's also like how kind of the traditional art world works is kind of the most expensive, the most valuable things are worth paying up a lot of money for because those are the ones that are going to be worth even more. So basically if you bought a Picasso uh, or you bought 
um, Andy Warhol like 50 years ago, those are the ones that are worth, like people at the time kind of laughed at you if you paid those prices, but those are the pieces that uh, accumulated value rather than like other artists. So that's kind of, I think, what he's thinking here where uh, Beeple is gonna be the Andy Warhol of the internet generation uh, and that's why it's worth paying a lot for this because this is going to end up in museums. This is going to end up in our history textbooks you know, 30 to 50 years from now. Um, cool. So, you know, this uh, sale happened, uh, you know, and as I said, uh, crypto art becomes mainstream. So, you know, you, it's on the headlines of, you know, New York Times. Uh, you know, Beeple appears on Joe Rogan, on uh, Jimmy Fallon. Uh, he's like basically turns into a celebrity overnight because, you know, this artist that was kind of living a semi like paycheck to paycheck, but like a very modest life just doing commission for clients, all of a sudden like pockets 69 million from one sale. And like that's like completely changed his life and really um, legitimizes the entire crypto art NFT space. So, you know, really after that, um, that was a turning point for crypto art. Um, so I want to kind of continue with some data. Uh, so this is um, kind of a volume graph of crypto art um, sales. Uh, and you can see the first blip was in March 2021, which was when uh, Beeple did that sale. And then the next blip, I think, was in August 2021. That's when art blocks went crazy. Uh, that was the generative art platform I talked about earlier. And that's when the floor price of like Ringer's Fidenzas, all of those generative art pieces, you know, shot up from like sub one ETH to like 40, 60 ETH or like kind of absurd amounts uh, because collectors saw those as super valuable. Um, obviously, it's come down since um, because of like there was a lot of speculative froth at the time. Um, but as you can see, as the volumes plateau, uh, kind of where it bottoms out is higher than like the previous um, before crypto art really became a thing. And that's always healthy because as long as the trough is higher than the previous peak, you know, uh, it kind of mirrors the history of like cryptocurrency cycles um, where kind of each uh, boom is higher than the previous bust and like so on and so forth as the space kind of has these uh, speculative frenzies, but over the long run, it legitimizes. And the la last thing I want to say is uh, the total market cap of, uh, cap of crypto art is only 0.2% of the total market cap of cryptocurrencies. And you know, the reason you know, we as a fund, we're making a big bet in NFTs is we think that percentage is going to grow significantly over time, that you know, crypto art NFTs is going to disrupt culture. And the total market cap of culture is you know, much, much bigger than like of non-fungible assets. It's much, much bigger than total market cap of fungible assets. Um, and the other thing I want to talk about is uh, kind of this. Uh, this is a screenshot from my website, cryptoart.io. But uh, you can see um, who the top ten artists here. So you have you know Pockets number one, uh, Beeple is number two, Snowfro, who's the founder of Artblocks, is number three. Uh, you have Tyler Hobbs, X Copy, D Dimitri Cherniak. Uh, these are some of the artists that I've mentioned earlier. And you can see the total value of their artworks are in the tens of millions to hundreds of millions. Uh, and it's, this kind of all came out of nowhere uh, in just a couple of years, uh, where in the you know, traditional art world, uh, these would be like pretty absurd numbers. Uh, but it shows how you know, there's a lot of collector demand interest in crypto art, and that's why uh, the total value of these artworks are worth the way, worth how much they're worth. Um, so we, you know, we kind of talked about the past and the present of crypto art. So I just want to talk a bit about the future of crypto art. Um, so kind of my first uh, prediction for what's going to happen is, you know, traditional art institutions are going to uh, start curating crypto art collections and feature them in uh, kind of museums uh, in, uh, in galleries. Uh, so this is actually an ongoing exhibit right now um, at, at the MoMA in New York. Um, it's by a generative art, uh, by an artist named uh, Rafiq Anadol. Um, it's, this is called Unsupervised, which is the name of his collection. Um, and I think R Rafiq, I believe, is the first crypto artist to be featured in MoMA. And I think there's going to be many, many more uh, artworks that are featured in MoMA. Uh, this is just kind of you know, a temporary exhibition. I think the MoMA is going to look to acquire uh, NFTs and crypto art as, as part of their permanent collection. And you know, that might require s selling some of their existing pieces, but I think that trend's going to happen 
um, in the next a decade or two. And you know, I talked a little bit about this earlier, but you know, throughout my entire talk, I was mainly focused on crypto art and the history of crypto art. But I think NFTs and non-fungible assets is a powerful medium, and that's not just going to disrupt NFTs, but also pretty much every vertical of like of culture and like creator entertainment industry. So you know, we talked about art. There's also music. There's photography. Um, there's gaming. Um, there's kind of like virtual real estate. Uh, there's like kind of the list goes on and on. And each vertical is like a multi, multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, and because of that, because the market is so big, I, I think um, it, will, it will support like not only you know, billion dollar companies, but also an individual NFTs uh, that are worth like much, much more uh, millions, billions, uh, who knows. Great, so that's really all I got. Um, here's my contact info, and happy to answer any questions. You want to play and I'll kind of with the Sure, mic. sure. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, so a major theme, so thank you for the talk today. Um, a major theme of the course is sort of both the history of blockchain and Web3, and then also where it's headed. So I have two questions for you. Um, the first one is that a lot of blockchain companies and ideas right now are still in the experimental stage, very much like we had with the internet in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. And that applies to cryptocurrencies, that applies to DeFi, that applies to NFTs, to crypto art. Um, so as you look at sort of trends that have happened here and sort of the history that you explain, what do you think the major areas in crypto art are going to be in the future where it actually plays sort of a transformational role? Because traditional art will still have a role too. And then the next question is uh, NFT technology is pretty nascent. And especially, you know, for example, when metadata gets stored off chain. Um, and so what sort of technological advances do you think need to happen to support those future trends in crypto art? that you think are going yeah, to happen. Yeah. 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 So first question, um, I think crypto art is just going to be like another um, category in like kind of art history textbooks that we'll talk, like another movement is like, you know, you had like, I don't know, like Rococo and like neoclassicism and like expressionism, abstract expressionism and like crypto art is just going to be like the next thing. And like, you know, each of these categories you had uh, like millions of dollars of like collector money poured into like collecting like who are the blue chip artists of each movement and I think crypto art is just like a continuation of that so I don't think it's going to like replace traditional art it'll, it'll just be a, a continuation of that where it'll draw in new collectors or like existing collectors will want to add crypto art to their existing collections. Uh, in terms of your second questions of like what technology is missing in like NFTs uh, you did like hit like a really good point is that you know NFT data metadata right now is like very centralized and like that's kind of the dirty secret of the NFT space is um, kind of where are these JPEGs stored? Well, it's just like a, a URL to, it's just a URL basically. And oftentimes that URL is just like a link to some AWS server. So whatever company is like hosting that server, if they go offline tomorrow, then you won't be able to render your NFTs because uh, it'll just get like a like 404 not found. So there are, there are companies working on this, like RV, Rweave is one. Um, where they're, they're working on uh, decentralized file storage. You know, Filecoin is another one that you've probably heard of. Um, basically, it means that if the company hosting the NFT metadata goes down, like the NFT doesn't disappear automatically because there's always someone else that's hosting, that's replicating, backing up like the metadata and the image. Um, so I guess just to follow up. Uh, uh, microphone? Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay, so I guess to follow up, do you think you know, when I, when I bring in this technology angle, um, the metadata is a thing, but do you think there are structurally bigger things that need to change in NFTs? So, um, you know, sort of like we need a new EIP to have NFT version two, and what would that look like? Uh, so, you know, I talked about 721. There's also EIP 1155. It's, it's the other ver a, a version of NFTs that allows for bundles. Um, I know there's a lot of new NFT um, 
EIPs that are floated around. Um, there's one on royalties that's uh, pretty popular. I don't ex remember the exact EIP number. Yes, so yeah, something like that. But uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of different proposals up there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I know that you just mentioned that um, you guys kind of see crypto being just a continuation of like art history, right? Um, well, you know, thinking back on art history, um, a lot of the conversation when those artists were alive, right, wasn't about necessarily the monetary value of what it was worth to larger audiences, right? Um, and so, you know, I was just hoping that you could comment on the fact that it seems like a lot of the conversation surrounding um, this particular artwork isn't necessarily about the beauty or what it captures about today's age or, cult, you know, culture. Um, but and thinking on and really in art history, a lot of the artists they, they weren't rich, you know, while they were alive, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I was just hoping you could comment a little bit about um, yeah, about how it can be a, how it can be thought of as similar to the path, to art history when in really in reality it, it really seems a lot to be a lot more about the money than, than it was before. Yeah, I, I think in crypto, just like the feedback cycle is like super super short. Is like I always joke that like. Uh, you know, one year in crypto is like 10 years in like any other industry. And like, I think that's why um, artists, um, like there's like so much talk about money going around, around because, you know, the artists are still alive uh, as these artworks are appreciating. Like, it's not like it takes tens, hundreds of years for like that phenomenon to happen. Uh, in terms of like, you know, uh, comments on like beauty, like how it reflects our culture. I think like that's why Beeple is like so valuable. It's like, he's kind of like Andy Warhol-esque where if you see like a lot of his artworks, uh, it's like really like commentary on like politics, like you know Trump, Biden, elections. Um, I, 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 could, I could probably pull up, I, I could do like a Google image search and like uh, show you uh, stuff. It works. I don't have Wait, actually, I do. Right. Yeah, it'd be it would be cool to show you like just. Uh, you just we go might to, need not. Uh, uh, NSW. Go to in people's. Oh, oh, it's people crap, I think, yeah. Uh, yeah, see some of the stuff, or... I don't think we should show it. Okay. Yeah, so some of the stuff is like probably not safe for work. <laughs> um, but yeah, you, you can see stuff. Uh, yeah, there's like Pac-Man, so there's like a lot of pop culture, you know, there's like Elon riding a doge, you know, this was when during the dogecoin like craze. So um, yeah, I guess you can say that like crypto art is like a commentary of like our culture and you know, people like this stuff because it's like fun pop art-ish. Yes. Hi, so um, I'm a double major in CS and art practice, and I also sell and share my artwork online, so your cool. talk was like super interesting and relevant to me. Um, I'm just wondering kind of about your personal background and motivation, like in all of the Web3 space, why specifically crypto art? Is like that the area that you're interested in? Like what makes creation and art your calling? Uh, well, it's I'm not just interested in crypto art, I'll first say that. So like kind of my background as a VC, um, like we're pretty sector agnostic. We invest in like not just art, but like DeFi mm -hmm. infrastructure, like really anything that's cutting edge and new in Web3 crypto that's like pushing the space forward. Um, I guess I got into crypto art because I was kind of early to it and I really liked the people in the mm -hmm. community. And like at the time, like, you know, back in like 2019, 2020, it wasn't really big. So it was just, I liked it because like the people were cool. And then, <laughs> then the money came, and then that kind of changed everything. Cool. Okay, thank you. So I'm really concerned about this recent this scam of the FTX, because personally, I am also a startup in Web3. I have all my, my startup in Web3. I'm from David Stace Lab, so I just motivated by David. But my point is, I think the auditing should serve as a very, very important, of a very important in your, in every Web3 startup. But you know, these kind of FTX, they have very shitty auditing system. That's the reason why they are a scam. That's the reason why they make this industry looks very terrible. So my reason, my, my question is, what kind of auditing system do you have? Do you work with Deloitte or some other PwC, something like that? Um, well, the problem with FTX uh, is like, 
it's like if you, if you cook the books, you cook the books. It's like the FTX scam had like nothing to do with like the what they were actually selling. Like it had nothing nothing to do with like cryptocurrencies. Like they could be selling like Beanie Babies, but like at the end of the day, if like you make up the numbers on the spreadsheet, is like that's just fraud. Um, I guess uh, I, I'm actually not sure which auditors FTX used. I don't think it was the big four, but um, it was that that issue. No, okay. Um, yeah, my yeah. question is actually the crypto, this decentralized property, makes the auditing extremely hard to audit what kind of blockchain or Bitcoin. And because I have very close friends in Deloitte, she says that actually it's very hard for them. They even need to know what Web3 what is about, what blockchain is about, to make sure that they can audit. Because they only have experience in auditing Web2 companies. And my point is, I don't want your company to become a scam like FTX. That's my warning to you. <laughs> yeah, well, I just like, the, another thing I'll say is like, this is like kind of the problem with centralized exchanges because as centralized exchanges at the end of the day like, are more like Web2 companies. Uh, and like, this is why DeFi is important is because you don't need auditors in DeFi. It's like all the tokens are stored, like say in this smart contract, this address on chain, you can just see that the assets are there. Uh, whereas if you're you know, hiding behind uh, say, you know, FTX or, you know, Binance or Coinbase, like one of these companies, centralized exchanges, then you're going to have to rely on trusted third parties as auditors. Finally, the last question. Are you do you, aware? Do you, do you want the microphone? Or? No, no, no. I, my, son, my, my son is loud. I don't think the recording can hear you. you no worries. Okay. It's just a private question. <laughs> so I just want to put in this question. Do you, do you know proof of work? I think you must, you must know proof of work, right? Proof of, like the consensus Bitcoin. mechanism. Yeah, Bitcoin, yeah. Do you know the optimal strategy of proof of work is centralization? Uh, what do you mean like through mining? Mine cooling. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You, do you know, also know that people will sacrifice their expectation in trade of the small variance? Uh, I don't really understand that question. My point is the optimal policy to win in the proof of work setting is the centralization. And you cannot say, hey, we are doing the decentralization, so we are good. I want you to rethink that the centralization can still happen, in, even in your decentralized setting. And this will lead to lots of problems, like the FTX. I want you to think this. Yes, there's always, there's always perspective. centralization risk and everything. Yes, so okay. that's the reason why I hope you guys can make your hands dirty to go to the theoretical foundation, like E374. Okay. Go deep. Do not it's like this. Yeah, I took David Seed's class actually. Oh, I audited it because uh, it was um, it was after I graduated. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we have, we, have, we have time for one more question. Sorry, Sorry. <laughs> You're good. All right. All right. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm not totally related, uh, but. Um, I saw on the top you have like DAO guides and like DAO tooling, and I'm really curious. Sorry, oh, I was just... no, this is uh, oh, Ido's okay. Laptop. Then maybe not not be <laughs> yeah. connected at all. Um, but I'm curious if you think a lot of the DAO spaces are going to be centered around NFTs as a way to establish membership or tiered membership. Yes. Um, and yeah, just your opinions on that and what you see. Yes. Uh, actually, one of the most OG DAOs is called Flamingo DAO. Um, uh, they were like one of the first art collector DAOs, uh, and they bought a bunch of early of art blocks pieces like super early on. That's actually like one of my biggest regrets is like a lot of my friends who joined were convincing me to join, but like I was kind of too slow and like lazy, and then then kind of art blocks took off, and the rest was history. But I think like collector DAOs is uh, going to be like a big trend over the next few years. Um, it's like mainly like group purchases of. Um, of like expensive NFTs and like collector DAOs are kind of like you know NFT like collectives investment funds and like where people can like pull their money together so they can buy uh, like a zombie punk or uh, like a Beeple one of one. Uh, so I, I think that's a a big trend. Yeah, or like follow up question. Yeah. Uh, I, oh, I guess I was curious. Wait, to, wait, wait, wait. Oh, sorry. I guess I was curious too in terms of like showing DAO membership. So rather than like currently a lot of your tiers within DAOs are oh, like, like based off of tokenomics. Passes. Yeah. So, so, but since a lot of tokens are being scrutinized legally um, and a lot more securities, it's difficult for DAOs to, uh, you know, to start creating a lot of their own 
tokens. And so would, do you vision a lot of these DAOs using NFTs and a lot of tool, DAO tooling shifting towards like ERC 721s and to be centered around NFT members rather than tokenomics? Yeah, yeah, that's one of the use cases of NFT. Another use case I didn't talk about is like access pass. It's like token gating, asset, token gating access uh, where you know, a DAO can have like, say addition of like 10 NFTs and like that's like kind of the most like gold standard, like the gold tier where like it's the most exclusive and you might have an addition of like 100, that's like the silver tier, like so on and so forth. There's um, you know, projects doing that. Uh, there's also like kind of artists um, like I guess I'm really into like like EDM, so like Armin Van Buren's like an artist who like dropped uh, a big like NFT, um, you know, token gated access uh, like Discord. So um, it's kind of like what you described. Is you have like these different tier membership, and each like, gives you you know certain privileges, like ex like ex ex exclusive access to certain concerts, like backstage passes, things like that. Thank you. All right, that's a wrap for today's class. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And lastly, give Richard. Great, thank you. Thank you, guys.